Oh, let's see. Hey, there we go. Oh, maybe not. Let's see if I refresh this. I can't tell if it's actually working. Lots of technical difficulties today. Let's see. Do we have a stream? Oh, yes. There we go. Perfect. I was waiting for the feedback to come from here and make sure it was actually on the screen. This uh, it was a pretty big challenge. We built a new studio computer. So there, there's like the first change. Um, and building a new studio computer means... To, well, the, the first time it booted, it decided it was no internet, despite being on the internet. So yeah, like all Windows problems, you just reboot and it fixes it. And uh, so we rebooted and we fixed it. And for those of you that don't know, the streaming computer that I use is running Windows, but I run Linux. So that's... Uh, Big difference. Actually, this is weird. Why am I missing? Um, where's my main cam? Is it, it says it's there, but it's not showing what it's showing here, but not showing here. I guess I got to edit the main camera. One of the fun things when you change everything is fixing where all the cameras show up. So let me. Oh, there I am. So, all right. I can't explain why I'm missing. Whatever I'm missing when I go here. So I'm, I, I got nothing right now. It was working just a little while ago, but that's that's just a new problem we get to sort out later. That's a new one. What about when I do the overhead? Well, the overhead's broke. So that takes away that. Then there's this, this, and this. All right. Whatever the switcher decided, it's not going to switch anymore. <laughs> uh, let me read all the comments. Welcome to the jungle. Yeah. I'm not singing that song. It's old. Let's see. You to do to do to do. Lots of stuff here. Ah, spicy chocolate. Yes. The spicy chocolate. I did that the other day. That's coming out in an upcoming video I did with some friends. So there will be a upcoming spicy chocolate video and we, we may do one here at the office i don't know if i want to do it again after yesterday i felt bad so uh what else we got here tesla ran out of battery nope that's not an issue got plenty of battery uh what else do we have what do i think of dray tech i'm sorry i don't like dray tech people always ask about them i think they're just popular in the uk they've had tons of security problems um, I'm not a big fan of the Draytech routers, so I got no use case for them. If you have a use, I don't know why they're so compelling. They're, I remember looking at them going, they're not particularly well priced and they're full of security issues. Like what's, what would make me want one of these? So nonetheless, nonetheless, that's, a, that's just how things go sometimes. But studio changes. First change was trying to get the studio to work. And I still don't know why this button doesn't work. It says it's working according to the setup. And it says there's a display, but I can see it's not coming through. So when I switch to this, it just doesn't show me anymore. I don't know why. That'll be something from later. Um, what is also, and I think I can fix this. If we go here, um, you can kind of see there's a table next to me. There, if I move the screen down. This is going to be my new desk. So this is actually where I'll be working very soon. So part of what I'm changing here in the studio is I'm getting rid of my office and making this my office. So this will be where I do all my editing. This will be where I talk to the crowd here and edit. And then when I'm missing something, I can just, I, I, I'm not in a spinny chair right now, but I'm putting a spinny chair here and I'll be able to spinny chair this way and talk to the crowd again. So uh, that's the one of the studio changes, getting rid of my office. So, uh, Matter of fact, Kyle, who's on the other side of the studio right now, slash kitchen area, uh, he gets my office. So, yeah, you're turning the kitchen into your office. Yes, I am. The kitchen will be my... Who doesn't want the kitchen or office to be one place? I know I do. You know, here's a question. Nope, still doesn't show up here. I can't figure out... Oh, hold on. There I am. All right, I am uh, less dumb now. All right. <laughs> Now I know how to make it work when I switch to talk about things. And we'll put the live chat back. All right. Now it's set up. Now it's set up. So 
It's actually going to be nice because the goal is with, I announced last time, last week, seven days ago, uh, that Brett is now vice president of making things happen here <laughs> at Lawrence Systems. And one of my goals has been to focus on more projects and content creation. And in order to do that, I need someone to do some of the businessy things. Brett's doing more of the business things. So now I'm just going to uh sit in this little area and create and i want to really focus on creating more content more in-depth tutorials and uh, part of it was just rearranging it and it's yeah it's a lot but it's going to be fun and uh i'm excited looking forward to it so it's uh the one other thing that may or may not happen is we have a big area here uh where the kitchen is versus where everything else is and if i'm too bothered by watching Kyle make his salad right now, I would, uh, I'll just put a wall up so I don't have to look at people make salads. And, uh, but other than that, that's like the big studio change. Now the studio system we built is a nice Ryzen system. And actually, uh, the picture I took that I posted at the beginning here is going, is the, um, I'll pull that up. Me going to micro center. So I, I was going to play a game and say, you know, can you guess where Tom is right here? Uh, because I realized the micro center is a little bit covered up, but you can you can figure out what's back there. But the Tesla had enough battery to go to micro center and back, so no, I didn't run out of battery heading over to micro center. So there's that for for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm kind of excited because uh, the other things are going to happen. This is getting rebuilt back here. Uh, that's our lab stuff and. Uh, because I may have another camera angle that comes from this way, because it, that way, when I sit up my desk, I haven't decided if I'll do that. I'll actually build, it'll be that way, another wall of different display things. But I'm going to rearrange like some of the switches, put some cool, you know, I guess the trendy thing to do with YouTubers is more LED lights. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be kind of cool to, I'm just excited to, you know, kind of like that when you build out your new desk and cable manage it and make it all nice you get excited about all that so i am excited about all that i'm excited there's so many people from all over the place like every time um i read all these it's like really cool now i'm seeing what do we got here chet uh we got someone from czech czechia switzerland um what else? UK? We got people representing from all over. Now, here's the other fun stuff. And this is one of those things that I knew people would complain about this. But that's why when I did the video on Rumble, other than someone telling me I was paid to do it, I've already seen those comments and whatnot. I was not. Uh, I completely... Puerto Rico, Yemen, Denmark. Wow. All over the place. But back to Rumble. When I did the video, I knew a lot of people. And this is also why I prefaced it with, hey this is a tool targeted at these people. Um, I've never completely understood this. I I guess from a ultra, if you want to lock everything down and not have anyone know anything about your network, like revealing your MAC addresses, for example, um, you could hide them. But honestly, knowing the MAC address of my laptop, it then requires you, let's say, you know, you wanted to uh, spoof my MAC address to gain some type of access that may be given. Now it takes you getting on my network to do it. So, I mean, it's not a zero risk, but it's not the highest risk. You know, knowing my MAC address doesn't give you that much more insight about. So I've exposed the MAC address to this many, many, many times. Um, but let's go a step further. What about the assets on your networking area and inventory? Well, obviously, if you're storing them with Rumble, there there is a security risk and but rumble's founded by people from rapid seven and they wrote the metasploit framework so i they're not amateurs at securing and locking down information and i'm not saying anyone is absolutely bulletproof and nothing could happen but they're at least a group of people that i'm like hey you know they can if they have that information but if you're not comfortable with information use nmap don't use rumble but the reality is we deal with all the assets and we use enable and Enable has way more data than Rumble does of the deep details. Matter of fact, not only data with things like solar winds, it is a two-way street. We have access to control these systems in their cloud. And you can say, well, you're creating a security hole. I'm like, yeah, but 
there comes a point where you have to trade some convenience. Like I can't manage the computers at the scale we do without a powerful tool that allows me to manage remotely all these computers. Same thing with Rumble. You kind of have a trade off there. Rumble, you have to say, I'm going to trust them with my network and with some of that information because I need to have a web panel of course they have a self-hosted version so yes if you have a um high-end uh government type networking you go i really want this information but i don't want to leave here they do offer self-hosted uh, i don't know the price on that but that's besides the point but there comes a point when we need to have with our staff here ways to remotely access masses of information i trust them better than i do facebook with data and things like that who's actually tra tracking your personal life it's just kind of a trade-off where they're going to have some data in their cloud system but enumerating your network is a great map but hopefully you've done everything you need to keep people out having a map of your network is only relevant once they get in they being some type of threat actor so it does not present a zero risk but offering or someone were to gather up all the mapping data it only gives them a map of the inside of your network. It does not offer them a way in. Well, like, technically, I guess it could offer a way in because they could look at it and go, you're running a really insecure server that you have public facing. But they may have found that way in anyway. So it's, yeah, it, it's a, the, the challenge we always have as an IT services company is um, having data that sits in all of that. So it's, yeah. It's a challenge. I'll address it. I think it's fine that I use the tool. I enumerated my network into Rumble's network. So yes, I feel confident that their uh, security is adequate as much as we can as much as we can hope for. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that you'll just have to do it. And if you're worried about it, um, use the tool that you like that keeps it all local. That's as simple as that. Like nmap is still free and map is uh really powerful you get it granted nmap takes a little bit more skill it's not as automated um but when you dive into it hey you know it does a great job and no i don't know you know i i mentioned this at the beginning of the video i i don't have time to review every one of them out there uh so you tell me rumble is a free sign up and a takes you from the time you sign up to the time you scan your network there's probably 15 minutes can pass and this entire thing can be done depending on the size of your network of course so i don't know compare it to those tools a lot of these other tools they're not free and like people ask me about i think it's ovic i haven't used ovic ovic requires me to talk to a salesperson to sign up for a demo so i don't have time to deal with getting on a mailing list to get a demo, I didn't see a, a like, hey, contact us. And plus, Ovic is a monitoring tool that has some discovery. Rumble's a dedicated discovery tool written to be really in-depth and does things that are pretty amazing. The opinions I've gotten back from my friends that I, you know, messaged them about this that were, hey, this is really, really cool and found things my other tools didn't. I did not make a list or a comprehensive list of these tools to figure out what they found. So I... Did the video, I suggest you try it if you have your favorite product. It's no risk. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything to sign up for Rumble and try it for free. So it's not, it's a pretty low risk venture to try it. So <laughs> that's how I feel. Like if you have a tool, take the tool you have, enumerate the network, do your discovery process, put it in a spreadsheet, run Rumble. Is there more information? Make that evaluation if that if that is something that works for you. Hey, cool, I have more information I had before. Do I want to buy that tool because it provides me more information? I feel Rumble is probably one of the best discovery and the speed at which it works. I thought it was just novel. The level of detail and the UI, cool. That's why I did the video on it. So, but it's not a... I, I don't have an exhaustive list because at some point I have a few other projects to work on besides just network discovery tools. Sometimes I do have the time to dive in and test more and more tools, but the same thing comes up with like FreeNAS. I've been a FreeNAS TrueNAS user for a long time, but there are other NAS services out there. I do like Synology. I found them to be very effective, but all the other smaller ones, I've looked at them, but I said, I don't really have the time to truly evaluate them and see if they're you know, better or worse. Most of the time they're worse. I mean, Unraid's probably the good runner-up that I've not tried. I know enough about Unraid that I think it's cool, but also Unraid doesn't use ZFS. Therefore, I take it out of the running. I think it's a neat product, but I don't really, it's not on my roadmap even now to use Unraid. People don't want to use it. The I know lots of happy people use Unraid. If you are 
uh, wanting to try it. I think there's enough reviews out there uh, for you to make an assessment on that. So, oh, let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. You said, uh, Joseph said, I have, I got Rumble, I have a Cisco, everything. You have two discovery tools from uh, Network Glue and Infobox and NetMap full of isolated nodes. Rumble didn't. Uh, they found everything. Okay, Rumble found everything. It literally found everything. Okay, and the two other tools did not. So there's some people chiming in here. Um, and that's why I, I, you know, I'd love to hear from people who already have a tool in place and are comparing this to whatever they had in place to Rumble. That's very helpful to people, you know. My goal is sometimes to foster conversation and get people engaged. And, you know, we all want to learn. I learn too. I learn a lot from the comments. I'm not just here talking about something. Occasionally, I learn from the comments about another tool or about another thing that may uh, work better. So this is, you know, I don't look at me spitting information out is just a one-way street here. I do enjoy the feedback and engagement I get from people. That's actually one of the reasons I have uh, my forums where I can have a more in-depth discussion like, oh yeah, this is a good point or that's a neat way to do this or this is a better way to handle it. Um, awesome. People who love the Home Lab Show. I really do enjoy the home lab show and me and jay uh we still have more ideas we want to put together we want to do we just got to figure out uh we, we just got to pre-set up an email address for it or something we kind of want to do a rapid fire question session on the home lab show and uh but i don't want to just do it for the people on the live show because i know some people timing and whatnot life happens and you can't be there at the same time we're live so we so we want to set up a bunch of uh we'll set up like a questions that all funnel to us for the home lab show and then we can uh do a q a where we have all the listener questions and some of the home lab questions you have uh that is on our roadmap to do that so we'll do some like q a things uh that get dropped as well so that um thank you for everyone who likes the show and it's definitely on the list of things we will be doing for the home lab show um let's see Studio changes in Rumble covered those two things. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, Rum Rumble's number uh, blew my mind. That's great. Um. Okay, so cool. HD HD Moore uh, has an interview with uh, Security Weekly, and he describes how maybe I'll just have to interview HD Moore. Why not? I'm excited. I. I I purposely do this, um, and I still think, um, hold on. I'll answer the DS question a second. Um, I, it's funny. I did the video purposely without contacting them. And one of the reasons I do things like that is to try to eliminate any bias. I mean, grantedly, I, there's some influence because the person who created Metasploit is obviously probably pretty cool. So you're like, okay, uh, that's some influence, so to speak, but that's still not the same as actually wanting to like a product. There's been plenty of people who create one product and the next product or next thing they do doesn't necessarily go as well or resonate as well. Um, but I thought it was funny that I had a few people commenting that I was paid and uh, I, I can't believe I, you're telling people to install spyware on there, which I thought was a really weird comment someone made. <laughs> But um, I try to do these uh, reviews as unbiased as possible on any of that. Uh, just to jump back to the Synology DS, uh, DS1621 XS Plus sitting on top of your rack. Yes. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to buy a DS1621 Plus non-XS or better stay away from the first devices that are Ryzen based? I have at my house right now actively doing stuff. Uh, one of the Ryzen ones I like. The Ryzen one, I'm happy with it. Um, I haven't had any issues. It's been running for a while, so I don't know of any Ryzen problems. I don't. I think Ryzen is a pretty well proven technology. Um, the obviously the question comes in is how good was Synology's integration with it? I'm gonna say I, I have a high level of confidence in Synology. I really have not had a lot of hardware issues with any of the Synologies. Someone's going to point out Gamers Nexus once did a video four years ago where he talked about a power supply failure. Yes, four years ago, Synology had some computers with power supply failure. All right, we've addressed it and moving on. <laughs> like, that happened. Um, uh, I'm I going to get my hands on 
the the netgate 6100 no there there can't possibly be a demo unit here anywhere i'm under nda so i will at some point in time be reviewing the netgate uh 6100 how's that so we'll just we'll just say that at some point i will be reviewing one <laughs> We'll just say that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right. Well, and I, I see someone mentioned uh, Domots for Map and Monitor. That's also why I said in the beginning when I did the Rumble video, it's not necessary. It's not a monitoring tool. Uh, monitoring, we use Avix. That's been my monitoring tool of choice. But that is different than the way it is offered through Avic or Domots. Those are different tools. And those are monitoring tools that have discovery options. So um, that's just one of the things. So, yeah, the um, donuts. Uh, yeah, donuts are, you know, insert like Homer. Mmm, donuts. I love donuts. So... But yes, donuts are not good for your diet. Sorry. If you cut them in half, they're half the calories. <laughs> now, the other uh, fun thing to come out of the Rumble stuff. So it's not like I did Rumble other than to raise awareness of it. I did not do it with the intention. One, I really didn't know how many people worked at Rumble. I made a lot of new friends on LinkedIn. So hi, anyone who may be watching from Rumble. So that was actually kind of cool. Uh, but I've been a big fan of Risky.biz, Risky, the Risky Biz uh, security podcast. Um, I've been listening to it for years. And Patrick, I've always thought, has a solid perspective. And I, I like the way that particular podcast goes um, for the way they don't. Actually, I like the way he does the soapbox and doesn't have a lot of ads in it. It just kind of the cadence of it's good. And I actually love that he's not in the U.S. because there's, I think, some other perspectives uh, that can be had. You know, I look at my audience here. How many of you um, shouted out cities that are way uh, far outside of the United States? Uh, nonetheless, I, I, what was really cool is this ended up me talking back and forth with uh, Patrick Gray, who's also friends with them. So it just it was kind of a cool thing to say hi. And he said he liked some of the content on my channel. And right away, I'm like, well, I'm a longtime fan of the show. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Risky Business Podcast, I'll pull it up so people know what I'm talking about. Which, of course, I referenced it in there. But it's it's pretty easy to find at risky.biz. And, uh, yeah, this is, if you're looking for a great security podcast, I brought it up before. I, have, I can't remember if I have it listed in my... I, I should probably do a new list. Um, I've talked before about all the different podcasts I listen to. But this one's been on my list for um, quite a while. You know, I do like Security Now. We, I know we, we talked about that one last week because Steve Gibson had brought up something that I talked about last week. I don't remember what it was. But um, but Steve Gibson did do a good dive into some of the latest Windows BS. Uh, so there's that. All the latest, you know, rounds of problems. So, uh, but nonetheless, that's... Um, it's kind of the errata that comes out of it. That's why I wanted to bring that up. So it was kind of cool to engage with people and uh, meet new people all the time that work in tech and work in security. I guess a lot of them were going to be at DEF CON. They offered uh, they, to meet up with them there, and I am not going to be at DEF CON. I was at specifically the Car Hacking Village because it happened here in Detroit. So even though DEF CON was referred to as DEF CON Safe Mode and was pulled off remotely last year, I was actually physically in attendance because I was there for the... Um, safe mode event with the um car hacking village so uh let's see what do we got here um we are currently sending out gray log and we'll be trying rumble later this summer hey awesome yeah uh gray log is uh me and wendell been talking we're, we're me and wendell from level one text we have a couple ideas for some videos but i tagged him on uh twitter when he was asking about a rare logging system i really think gray log is a pretty solid logging system and it's i don't really have a solid second competitor to it that works at the level gray log works at i mean there's a lot of ways to build it like the diy method and people are going but tom what about building your own elastic stack and da 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 da, -da and Great log is nice because yes, it does have elastic on the back end, but it's a more complete system with a proper update path as opposed to the kind of build it yourself method. So um, I want to do some more gray log videos. That's actually part of the 
it's this is a long time goal I've been working on is to get someone like Brett in here um, to take over more business functions because the business stuff takes time and it's it's a juggling act of hey Tom what are you gonna do create a video or make money with the business to make sure everyone uh, gets paid and make sure all the customers are serviced uh, when it comes to the videos I've always joked and said it's a hobby because it does take second to my content creation is a secondary thing I do compared to the first priorities are making sure everything with the business is always taken care of. Um, but this is also now that Brett's doing that more, I can just like, this is another half of the building. The, the way my building is bisected, half of it is like business. The other half, well, less than half over here because it's, it's kitchen and studio. And then I just want to be mentally in this creative space more often so I can do things like more in-depth videos on gray log. So, did I manage to get any recipes written from Greylog? No, not. I I fixed enough of the regex to make it function, um, and I have that uploaded on my. I believe the GitHub link that I have for when I did the Greyhog video is where everything is, because um, I had to update it for uh, when PF Sense went to two point five. They changed the syslog format, but other than that, other things I ingest are normal. Like I. We, we host a few different things here. So that's all normal log ingestion. So there's nothing I had to do special for anything else. Uh, the SIM monitoring that it can do is where I've stopped. I haven't got to that part yet. That's kind of on my to-do list. I am talking to a couple people on some SIM monitoring things. Uh, I don't have a, I don't have a particular love for any one service, uh, but we are looking, and I'll give a shout out to them. I've done a review with their product. is called Stamus Networks. I have some ideas of the way that can integrate well with PF Sense. I don't know if it can. They don't know, so to speak, yet, because not because they're not smart, but because we haven't tried some integrations. But um, they're they're one of the products that we are looking at. I've been engaging with them, uh, doing demos and things like that. Uh, yeah, Grafana and Loki. Once again, there's plenty of DIY system. Grafana and Loki is not as complete as Graylog. And the problem I've run into with any of those tools is when there's updates, they seem to break. Um, I've not found them to be as stable. They're good products, they're good setups, but when there's version changes, it doesn't just, like Graylog, hit update. No problem. Here, we got the new version of Greylog. We hit update. It was it was that easy. Um, that's one of the reasons I like Greylog. They have a really solid interface. Granted, Grafana makes things super pretty. But by the way, you can also grab, and Greylog doesn't just ingest logs. You can tie things like Grafana to it if you wanted even better dashboards. I don't care as much about the graphical uh, dashboard, so to speak. It doesn't have to be pretty that's something management likes a lot and home lab people like it i'm kind of in the middle where i'm i guess i'm kind of home lab but the real pretty of the grafana doesn't really do it for me i really care about functional actionable intelligence you know maybe some charts to tell me trends but not it doesn't have to be overly pretty for me to be impressed by it uh it has to be very actionable um that's what matters to me the most oh uh... Uh, Greylog confused because you can't get VM VMware VDS switches to work with it. I don't know why you can't get the the the, the, the switch not support an export. I don't understand the question. I guess it's so like Unify works with Greylog because it supports Syslog. So does other switches we've tested with it is because they support Syslog. So as long as you have things that support you know outputting Syslog. You're good. So, uh, or it supports more than syslog, but syslog is that common language, so to speak, that is simplistic enough uh, that you can get Greylog to ingest it and many things just to spit it out. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I don't know anything about, and, and this is... You know, how much do you pay a technician? That's very relevant to where they are, circumstances of the job. The pay for tech people is all over the place. Um, there is not anything I can easily address. Because it's not like it's, there's not an answer to the question that's an answer. There's so many parameters that go into how much do you charge or how much do you uh, pay or what markets are you working in are all 
just a series of variables that go into how much do you pay a technician. There are some general baselines that can be had, but it's still really all over the place. It's not, there's not like, there's, there's not a exactly this answer type thing. Uh, what is the white, the small white box and red with red? Oh, that's a, that's one of these little Unify switches. So I, I've reviewed these before. It's the Unify USW Flex. So, uh, this is something, um, I actually, this is the one that I use as a port tap. I was setting up port taps and uh, that's why it's dangling off there as I was testing. That's actually a cool use case for these is if you need to port tap something, um, you can configure this and then you can mirror port and configure a port tap for doing SIM testing. I actually was doing some uh, security onion stuff with it. So can TrueNAS replicate to TrueNAS with a uh, non-root account? I don't think so. There's maybe some way to do it, but not that I know of. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it's not normally how it's done. I'm trying to think, though. You know what? Actually, I well, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Most of the time, it's, you're, you're in control of both boxes, so you use the root account to do it. Um, there's probably a way you can get it to do it differently. All right. Uh, let's see. Can I force 2.4 gigahertz clients rather than creating SSID for 2.4? I don't understand that as a question. You can create a single SSID with 2.4 and 5, or you can create individual SSIDs, uh, one called 2.4 and one called 5, for example. I always create one because it's easier. What else we had here? Uh, let's see. So, oh, it, it, now this is where things get complicated. Um, so I, this is a fun discussion. If you go to Reddit, our MSP, and I think this is where I've seen this discussion. Uh, and this is back to the pay topic, UK versus US. There is a massive difference because I, I, I laughed at this cause this is just typical of the US and it's something that people from the UK uh have learned by you know engaging uh with a lot of people here someone was talking about how vacation works and they were explaining the pay packages over on reddit r msp i'm not even i don't remember the link but i just remember seeing it maybe a week ago or so but i thought it was funny because someone was pointing out like hey after they hear so long the u.s person they get this many days of vacation and someone says here in the UK, that's how much vacation I get the day I start. Like, what the hell's wrong with all you people? You just don't have uh, that many days off. So w when you talk about, like, the pay being lower in the UK, you also have to think about the fact that you get all these different maybe paid days off and different benefits that may not come with the U.S. job. Also, this is, you know, in, in, in the interest of conversation, um, if you have a job healthcare in the United States is a separate from the business, so to speak. Like it's not part of the national, though we don't have a national proper healthcare system. So you end up with healthcare premiums and are they taken out of your pay? So you make X per year minus what may be taken out of your pay for healthcare, but then employers may choose to match a certain amount. And that's not a set standard. Employers don't have to do that. Matter of fact, some employers, if they don't offer any healthcare at all, you have to play completely out of pocket. So when you compare your salary to another country that does have a healthcare system that doesn't take it out of your pay directly, you have you can't say the pay is the same. Um, there's a lot of complexity in that. So once you, it's hard enough trying to figure out pay in the United States. When you start throwing in other countries, pfft, you got more variables than you. It's it's hard to do. Um, matter of fact, I, I didn't even know this. I was talking to someone who has some inter, one of my friends has a company with a lot of international employees. They don't even like dealing with it. So they don't. Uh, well, they don't have the competency to deal with it. So there's apparently these special employment agencies. So if you're based in one country, there's employment agencies that handle your benefits and all the legalities that come with dealing with someone who's in a different country. So there's 
there's just so much to it. It's it's very novel. Um, it's uh, yeah, there, it's it's conversation, but it's not. A, there's no easy answer here. There's not anything I can just say. It's this. <laughs> so that's as much as I'll say on that topic. Uh, 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 do, 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 do. do you have any recovered XC PNG to new server? I think that's not a conversation. Zen Orchestra. Let's see. Uh, in France, your your company starts you off with 42 days leave. Yeah, the, a lot of the European area gets way more leave than you do here in the U.S. So, uh, okay, so they do deduct it out of here automatically. It's it's a lot different here. That's you know, there's actually um. There's a kind of fun YouTube channel. I think it's called Lost in the Pond. And it, some of the stuff's kind of amusing to me. He just covers. He's from the UK. And he covers the things he's learned now that he's an American. I've always loved one. And I have a few friends from the UK living here. And it's always fun when they just have something that's totally different. And they're just like, this is weird to us type thing. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, other people are familiar with the Lost in the Pond guy. He's he's entertaining, um, especially foods. Foods the the food differences between here in the UK are uh, interesting to me. So, because there's things that are very close, and there's things that are just very different. And um, I really want if I go, I have not been to the UK. If I go though, I do want. I like fish and chips here. And I would love a real fish and chips from the UK with real vinegar. Because uh, I think Tom Scott did a video on the real and fake vinegar problem. I remember reading about that. I didn't even know there was a fake vinegar problem. I don't think we have the fake vinegar problem here. But apparently in the UK, there is some kerfuffle about fake vinegar. The other thing I learned is the honest pint. Uh, my friend, we were at the bar and we were, he was talking about, they just poured in any glass. I'm like, yeah, so it's clean. That's all I care. And you're like, no, you. it's not consistent from bar to bar. Like how much you get poured and how much you get charged. I'm like, there's a place where it is? <laughs> like, <laughs> there's all kinds of fun things when you start talking about the difference. How limited are the backups on standard XOA versus uh, premium? Couldn't find the difference on our site outside of snapshots. They have it on their... Um, uh... It's, they have a matrix for their pricing guide. So, full backups versus smart backups. They have it broken down on their site here. Actually, we'll go back. If you go to the pricing, they have this right here. Full backups versus smart backups. So, um, on the different versions. Like, backup all VMs in a pool. Or we we'll go back, and then they have what are full backups, backups of a snapshot. So they do have that broken down on their website if you want to know the differences in uh, versions on Zen Orchestra. Well, and uh, Cody here from uh, Mac Telecom Networks, he's in. He's actually really close to us, but because he's in a different country, uh, Canada, you you have, once again, more nuanced differences that are going to end up there. So, yeah, it's... Uh, taxes in Canada are different, but uh, the taxes are a whole nother really complicated, so... Uh, I don't know what T-O-D-Y-L is, and I have no thoughts on it, because I don't know what it is. So, the answer to that is no. I've not done whatever T-O-D-Y-L is. Um, oh, uh, Adam Rusa has a video on why chocolate tastes different in the United States versus elsewhere. So uh, if you look up Adam Rusa chocolate, you'll find that video and uh, it's great. So. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I have a question about PBX appliances. What do most of the Soho versions come with? Uh, surplus FXO ports or only one FXS, i.e. I don't know. I am not the PBX appliance expert. I also don't deal much with the FX ports. All the stuff we're doing is IP. We rarely touch anything that's not IP. So uh, I can't answer outside of it. Um, if it's if you're talking about IP PBX stuff, that is something we deal with. But non IP PBX, sorry, um, it's far out of my. I mean, I've done free PBX, but only the IP side of it. It, it supports all kinds of cool, you know, um, old school uh, analog stuff you can tie into it, which is great. I don't run into it anymore, or I, I run away from it now. I'll just I'll, I'll just say I'll just run away from it. I don't deal with it much. Um, what are good devices out there for LTE while in fan failover? I don't know. I don't have any particular company I love in it. A lot of people seem to like Cradle Point. We just run into a lot of Cradle Points that people have. They seem happy. Um, but I I won't give my endorsement to any of them because we use them, they work, but there's not I'm not taking the time to really assess them. Mm. Uh... No, regarding regarding replication from TrueNAS to another TrueNAS uh, as root user, wouldn't that mean that TrueNAS box is compromised if the off-site TrueNAS box is compromised? No. And the reason why is I have root access on this. And if I use my root access to go into your root access, unless you've got the same credentials I do, no. So if you set your two TrueNAS boxes to have exactly the same credentials, then you have a problem because if they can figure out the credentials on one, they would have the credentials on the other because you did that. I recommend that each one of your boxes have different root credentials. Different root credentials does not lead to compromise. The way two TrueNAS talks to each other is with SSH keys. So that actually is what uh, allows them to talk is you'll sign the keys. The reason you'd give the password is so you it will take care of the keys and managing for you, but it doesn't actually save the password. It's only going to save a hash of it and it's going to create a key pair between two TrueNAS boxes. And that key pair is not a two-way street. I create a key pair from TrueNAS A so it can send data to TrueNAS B and that's it. That does not mean TrueNAS B can automatically, if compromised, send data back the other way. But if all of your data on TrueNAS A is being replicated to B and they corrupt that data and the replication is not stopped, then they're going to send the bad data over there too. And of course, if they have control of your TrueNAS box on TrueNAS A, they could, in, they could go through and say purge all the data because they have access to it. So there are some risks, uh, but that's where you maybe look at the strategy of uh, the way you replicate it. Uh, do -do 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 -do. Let's see. Uh, you never been to a live stream before, Andrew. Welcome to the live stream. Um, 3CX is pretty good. Like People like it. I, I've, I know people who are uh, resellers of it and they seem happy with it. We don't use it. Uh, we are working behind the scenes here, something Brett's working on, um, and I'm, I'm championing it to some extent, is we are looking at becoming a VoIP provider. So news on that coming soon. I'll let you let you know. It's not 3CX based, not what we're doing, though. Um, do you have recommendations for a decent 1080 or, or, or 4K camera that works well for surveillance station and not breaking the bank? Um... I think it's, is it Amcrest? Hold on, I'll tell you, we've been ordering them. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. I don't know, maybe my staff will chime in on that. Uh, post that in the forums. I've talked about it before, and I don't remember I don't remember the brand names. I remember ones we've ordered, but if you post in the forums, I'll answer the question. Uh, let's see. Some people like the Dehuas. They work. I don't think it's... I'm trying to remember the ones. We've got a bunch of... We deployed several different ones. We had a failure of one brand more so than the other. And we've been going with the other and we've had very few failures. I will get that information from my staff and post it in the forums if someone asked the question. So... Uh, I never use UR Backup. So... 
we don't, so I haven't used UR Backup. I don't have any experience with it to give you any opinion on it. Um, yeah, 3CX is not open source and also does have licensing attached to it. They, they got like free tiers, but they, as you uh, go up in there, there are um, licenses that you need to have for 3CX. Yeah, Synology Active Backup, that is something we do use because it works so well. Um, I'm a big fan of Synology Active Backup. Like, I uh, I definitely put that on my recommended list. Um, I don't use Home Assistant. Uh, Jay from Learn Linux TV, I think he's done some videos on it, but he's a Home Assistant user, so I think he may have a couple videos on Home Assistant. He's got a pretty slick setup with it. Uh, I know because I've been to his house, <laughs> so his house, his studio, uh, same place for him. And so I'm aware of uh, how his, his setup works, and it's pretty slick. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, by the way, there's a few of you on here that looks like there's about 200 of you. If you could bash the like button, that'd be great. Just smash that thing, destroy it, make those likes go up. Do it for the YouTube algorithm, because that's that's what our life is driven by, is computer algorithms so we can all connect with each other. We have to be nice to the algorithm so they'll let us talk to each other. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's all that bad. It's not that dystopian. Um, it's, it, it's something I joke about. I, uh, I do plenty of AFK and well, you know, I actually spend a lot of time with technology, but I don't mind stepping away from it. I don't mind disconnecting from it. I still do that pretty frequently. Um, it, especially disconnecting from the online hive mind and doom scrolling on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media of your choice. Um, social media is not for everybody. I, matter of fact, I, I wish there were less everybody's on there sometimes. So I go on there, I'm like, how did I get this person on there? They just have dumb things to say. <laughs> mm. Um, I don't know the exact answer to this because it doesn't break it down this way. So the question is, does YouTube premium earn me more or less money? I don't know. YouTube breaks out ad revenue, but not granular as in, I don't have a value to put on those users. I guess I could, but it doesn't, I don't really have a calculation. They give, they give me ad revenue for ads and they give me premium revenue for premium viewers. And, but I don't think it gives me, I'd have to double check unless they've updated the analytics, which by the way, I seem to be sitting at a computer, which I can probably look at the analytics. Uh, let me see if they have that information. Well, all I really need is number of users and how much revenue, but I don't think they give it to me that way. I think they just tell me this much revenue from uh, one source and this much revenue from another source, but don't they don't give me the, you know, why. Like, they don't say this thousand users did this and this one did that. So, um, is that information in here? Kind of. Yeah, they have it. So, I guess, but they don't have it with, I'd have to do some math to really answer that question. They do break out the revenue, uh, and I guess I could divide it by how many people viewed. So, if I did the views divided by that, but, the, ah, you know what, the piece I'm missing the piece I'm missing is I don't know how, it doesn't tell me how many of those users were YouTube premium versus those users that were um, uh, not premium. It just, it gives me the revenue breakdown for what I earned for from premium users versus ad users, but I don't have the count of users for each of those categories. So that means I don't know. That's all I can, uh, yeah, I can say, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, 200,000 subscribers. Thank you very much for that. So that's, uh, yes. That is awesome. Thank you, all of you that do subscribe. So uh, that, that's been pretty exciting. They don't give me a plaque for 200K. Uh, I have a 100. It got dropped on the, it's still on the floor. Yeah, still on the floor. It fell on the floor when we were putting the table together. It didn't break, but it's on the floor somewhere. Uh, is my 100K. The next milestone plaque you get is going to be at the um, 1 million mark. But hey, you know, it's ramping up there. 
Um, I'm going to say it does help creators. I mean, it's it, it represents, this is the part I don't know. It represents over 10% of my revenue, but I don't know if it's 10% of my viewers. So I can tell you it's 10% of my revenue comes from YouTube premium. I don't know if 10% of my viewers are using YouTube premium. So I, it's a, uh, that's, that's the part of the equation I'm missing YouTube. And I understand why they don't want people gaming it. And trust me, some YouTubers, their goal is constantly just to game the system. So yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, uh, any experience with TrueNAS Scale? I did a video on TrueNAS Scale. I have a TrueNAS Scale machine we've been testing. That's my experience with it. Uh, it's still in beta, so I think it's pretty cool. I like where they're going with it. It's, I so it's in beta. It's not something I would run in production yet. Um, yeah, you know, here's the thing. People like Linus, he has a little bit more insight. Uh, once you get to be bigger, I allegedly will have one one day, but it's hit and miss. And I've talked to some friends that have over a million subscribers. Um, you get a channel partner manager, you get someone inside of YouTube to help you out. Their help is limited. And, um, sometimes they give you insight and information. Sometimes they kind of don't. Um, YouTube is just very kind of in, I, like I said, I kind of understand why, but they're kind of opaque on how their algorithm works. So yeah. Um, are you going to cover serious SAM vulnerability? Um, I don't know. I think there's enough people covering it that I don't need to. I didn't. Yeah. I, I don't really, I don't know. I, I, I think it's out there enough. I am not a big windows guy at some point. Cause you have to really address securing it. I then would almost want to or have to dive into, and maybe I'll have someone else on the show to help me with that. Um, I wouldn't, I thought about making like a, everything you have to do to turn off all the defaults in Windows to make it secure. Uh, I think Windows slogan should be insecure by default. They leave a lot of things baked in and turned on that you have to turn off to make everything secure. And I think that's part of the problem with Windows that you don't run into with a lot of other operating systems. I mean, the modern design is leave it all off and turn it on as needed. And you're starting with the principles of least privilege. We have locked this down to very, very few privileges. And then you work your way up to turning on services on an as needed basis where Microsoft doesn't want to break compatibility. So they have tons of legacy things enabled and baked into the systems in the on position um, that a proper lockdown would do it. But it seems like they should have an option at the beginning. And it, how hard would it be for Microsoft to do that, to create an option at the beginning and say, hey, we're gonna, do you wanna lock this thing down because you're building a new modern network and you're fine with all the latest authentication protocols and only turning on things needed for this particular server? Or do you have to tie this into legacy compatibility and here's this other button? I don't know. Um, I did a video on Greylog, it's on my channel. I I seen, I saw that earlier, I seen someone just ask that again. So yes, there's a video on Greylog, check my channel. <sighs> Hey, thank you. I do. I'm still going to make some more business videos. Uh, me and Brett were tossing around some ideas today. Uh, reusing old hardware for new tests. Not really. It's not the Jay did some videos on this. I mean, Jay had a discussion on it. He did a video on repurposing some old laptops. The problem is new hardware is just so cheap. And you can get some life out of them. You know, you can find some purpose things to do. You can do some learning. But with new hardware being so inexpensive, uh, really old laptops just don't have, I don't know what to do with it. Like, I, we just recycle. Matter of fact, it's almost a shame sometimes when we're throwing things in recycling going, what are you going to do with it? Because you can't even contact schools. They're like, what are we going to do with it? We need, we're trying to teach them modern things. We can't use these old things. Uh, so there's not, there's not a big demand for it uh, because you can pick up, I mean, this computer right here, this is an X250. This thing's like five or six years old, but it still runs most of the things I wanted to run. That's why it's kind of like the studio laptop here. Um, but you know, it's, you can pick this laptop. I think you can probably buy it on eBay for in a hundred dollar range. Uh, so you take something even older than this, what do you do with it? I don't know. Yeah, on by default, which is insecure by default. Uh, 
Um, MSP startup do's and don'ts. That might be a fun one. Um, I don't know. It, the, the, you know, the problem is it's like the same repeated questions of what do I use? Oh, I can't use that. So everyone goes for some cheap RMM tool, whatever they can get for free. And then, cause they can't meet the minimum seats. It's kind of hard. It is hard starting an MSP. If you're starting out and you don't have a potential, at least hundred seats that you can start with, it's hard to find the right MSP tool for that. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it, it's, there's stuff to talk about with it, but it's kind of like, I don't have easy solutions for it. Go land a hundred client, go land a hundred seat client so you can get some of the minimums to do it. <laughs> Hey, you got started with Bitwarden and you removed the Dell pass, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Chrome password manager. Great. Um, XCP and G and a CLI. I don't know. It, most of the time, if you're, you're doing something special, if you need to do the CLI and there is documentation that they have on it. And, um, it's cool because it's all, you know, API driven. So you can do all kinds of neat little function calls from the, um, CLI to get things going in XCP and G. But I don't use it enough. I, for the most part, like even when we do consulting, it's the only time I'm on CLI is when someone did something that they broke and I'm undoing something they did. But like if I were to set up a stack for someone, someone says, hey, I'm just going to have you build me an XCPNG and put it in our back end. Uh, I'm not really spending much time on a CLI at all. I'm pretty much not on the CLI. The, the exceptions are going to be like, I believe there's still a CLI parameter you need to turn on for the heartbeat for the HA. I'm sure I remember if that still needs to be turned. We don't do a ton of HA. Um, well, people always start with they want HA. They start learning what's involved in HA and go, oh, I really just need multiple servers tied together in a cluster. There we go. You need a cluster, not an HA. Anyways, um, there's not much you need to do ever on the command line that you can't just get done from the Zen Orchestra interface. So that being said, it's, I mean, I don't know. Uh... All right. Um, I don't have time to evaluate all the RMMs. That's going to be another challenge. If you like Synchro, awesome. We are in it. Uh, we've been using Enable and see. Well, I want to. I am going to do an updated video on this topic because the naming is confusing. I understand in depth in even under NDA all the details of what went on to move Enable. Uh, I see that too. And what happens is, let's go back to the beginning. Like we started with. GFI, I think it was my one was called. The years flew by around 2014 or 2013. We moved from GFI, they got acquired. You had GFI Max Focus. Uh, I can't remember which one came first or second. Then they got gobbled up by Solar Winds. That's how we became a Solar Winds company. Then we started using more and more of the Solar Winds tool set, Solar Winds MSP tool set. Then Solar Winds, uh, starting this year has become enable, but only the solar winds MSP. And it's not let the spin out. I mean, it's obviously a lot to spin it out, but they were always an independent company because they were built by acquisition and then they were their own entity. And now they're back to being their own entity, but without the same HR department. So it's like they split them off. They did share some resources, but they didn't really share the dev team because solar winds is a company of a bunch of, you know, silos that were uh, bought and called a single brand. But like the breach, for example, happened in the Orion, which is a completely different product platform with a completely different audience outside the MSP space. So we've always been on the MSP side of it. Now we're still on the MSP side of it. Now we're part of enable. Um, and because we've been using it for so long and have so many endpoints in there and it's where we have so much of our workflow tied to i don't really take the time because of the time consuming nature of that of trying to evaluate different systems i do know from talking to my friends who use different ones nobody loves everything about their system nobody says this system's perfect anyone who's used it at scale and in depth and insert name of any system there's a long list of complaints they have about it so <laughs> That's all there is to it. Have you looked at tactical RMM? Um, the problem I have there is I don't, the security has to be top notch. And I think I am all excited about that, but until it can go through the level of security auditing that happens in the world that is like enable, then no, I can't trust our clients to it. Um, it it's, it's tough. The, 
level of the layers and incident response people and everything that are involved in in the whole enable network is impressive um we've gotten a tour of this like we know what they're doing right now today here in 2021 to lock that thing down and actively uh test everything about it that you know it's a very powerful tool and uh kaseya you know as much as they claimed they clearly were not doing proper uh and thorough pen testing that's how kaseya led to the kaseya problem that it is these tools are very powerful they have to be for us to do our jobs therefore i have to very much put a lot of faith that whoever's writing the tool is doing so in a really secure manner so while i think tactical rmm looks cool um I don't know how security audited it is, and I'm not willing to roll the dice on our clients. Um, so that's <laughs> that's where I'm at with Tactical RMM or any of the other ones out there. So, uh, let's see. Big fan of ConnectWise. Yeah, I have a friend who's a total ConnectWise. Uh, top to bottom shop. Um, he's he likes it, but he has the same. When it comes to some things like handling updates and software updates and stuff, there's always a little goofy stuff that just doesn't work well. Um, everything else is just nuance of learning the product. None of them are absolutely perfect. Nature, we're all they're all wrestling the same beast. The problems, if you really drill down, are like how do you deal with some of the stupid problems that Microsoft creates that we have to deal with. So. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, what are your options for hardware for building PF Sense? Build it. I mean, PF Sense does not need an incredibly uh, high-end system to route at gigabit. So, yeah, it's it's not a bad system, but. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not that bad. It's like you don't need that high end of a system unless you're going 10 gig, but you said 500 meg. You, you can find some pretty reasonably low end spec stuff. You could even probably find some. There's a good use for used computers. They If you don't use them as a uh, browser on them and you you know don't try to run something like Google Chrome, uh, Google Chrome's resource needs are much greater than that of PF Sense to get the data to Chrome. All the <clears throat> data routing is lightweight. The data rendering that Chrome does is heavyweight. So you can actually find an old computer and it'll run PF Sense. So you don't really need that high of specs to even run 500. Oh, let's see. Any GPU virtualization solutions? Nothing I really do. Uh, I don't. I don't really do much of the GPU virtualization. So. I think that uh, Jeff from Craft Computing has some videos on GPU virtualization. Wendell has a really good write-up over at Level One Tech. So it's if you go through, there's a if you type in like Level One GPU virtualization, there's a whole bunch of guides that they've wrote on how to do it. So yeah, there's um, definitely uh, a, a lot to it. Yeah, Pro Proxmox, uh, KVM. You can do it in XCPNG. Someone has commented before that they've got it done. I don't do it, so I don't have an interest in doing it. How's that? Like, I don't, I don't really... It seems like a novel thing, but in the scheme of what Tom wants to get done first, that's really low on a priority. Like, if I was bored, I would do it. I haven't been bored enough to do it. I have so many other things I want to cover... And that even includes what's on the table right here. I mean, this still hasn't been covered. This is getting ready to be reviewed because that's why I've got so many things on here. This is the uh, Unify Aggravation Switch. Matter of fact, the other video I started working on is these. So can you read that? That's 25 gigs. Matter of fact, so is this is 25 gig card. So I got all kinds of 25 gig stuff that I'm working on right now. That's some of the next videos I'm going to be doing are all about 25 gig. I, but in somewhere in between, I decided to remodel my office. And uh, so that. So I got a table here. I have a lot thing. Oh, I want to. Uh, there's this too. I got this to plug things in. Isn't that cool? It's kind of dingly. 
So I have more, we're building some new racks. So we're building some new spots to put more servers. So I'll be doing videos on that. I have like a lot of things going. So, so many things. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, neck eight sixty one hundred. We talked about it earlier. Oh yes, the Nvidia licensing limitations and stuff like that. So, am I going to cover a twenty five gig firewall? Not likely. Um, the twenty five gig firewalls you're probably looking at either if you're in the uh, PF Sense space, the TNSR. Those are really not something you as of right now in 2021, not something you're seeing delivered to your average office. There are, of course, plenty of high-end places with, you know, higher 25 gig or higher connections, but most of your office buildings don't get this. Um, 25 gig is still more of an internal thing, and that's the perspective I'm going to be covering on 25 gig. So, oh yeah, unify aggravation, aggregation, take your pick, I don't care. We've been testing it. Uh, it's been running in a stack for it's out of the stack now so it's on a table it usually sits over there uh for for those who are astute watchers of the channel it's been in this it's been in Iraq for a little while and turned on so yeah it all depends on what you're doing I mean if you're in the data center you're gonna see a lot more of it there are people who have you know the uh faster connections like that but it's not it's not common um outside the data center it's not like Everybody just has 25 gigs and piped into their office. Oh, I mean, enterprise companies do. I mean, my friend, uh, he works for the hospital. Um, well, when he did, he, he works somewhere else. Now, when he worked for the hospital, man, they had incredible connections. <laughs> like, um, there, he worked for the large healthcare providers here. And he's like, oh, yeah, we got, I forget what he told me he had, but it was, it was impressive, the speed they had at the main building. So, what's a good business book for MSP startups? Uh, Carl... Carl Perchek, um, Carl's book, Carl Perchek MSP book. Um, uh, what is Carl? How do you spell Carl's last name? If I will, I'm trying to find the name of it. I can't remember it. Manage services in a month is what it's called. So here, now I can find it. This is in a month. Pa Paula, I'm bad with names. This book. So, uh, he's a super nice guy. He's got a YouTube channel as well. Uh, me and Carl have talked. If you if you dig around, you'll find me and Carl actually interviewed. He has a podcast as well. So, um, relatively inexpensive book here. Find it on Amazon or wherever you want to find books. Uh, but yeah, that's probably, I can't think, I don't know that many of them. Yeah, you'll see higher than 25 gig in data centers and things like that, so. Uh, TNSR is Linux-based, not BSD-based. Uh... Once you get into the 25 gig, you're really not talking. I mean, Unify has this uh, aggregation switch that can do 25 gig. But if you're in the data center, you're looking at some of the really high-end brocades and junipers and other companies that make switches that can actually uh, do routing and things. And you're going off the scale of the home lab. It's not, I don't think, I mean, I've seen there's not, the number's not zero, but overall, not a lot of home labbers with uh, 100 gig switches and things like that out there uh, in their home lab. So it's, it is much more of a data center thing. It's not something we deal with every day. We, you know, we deal with a lot of the smaller stuff. There's times when we have dealt with some of that, but it's not, it's not our, uh, what we do day to day. I do know people that do. Um, it's kind of cool. You know, some of my friends deal, uh, they, they have some really cool stuff they get to do. Tom, Tom will eventually do some of that. And, uh, well, I will be doing videos, though, and setting up 25 gig with this. So, because not everybody realizes that the way these, uh, where'd it go? There it is. The way these SFP cables, SFP plus cables, 
uh, or SFP28 cable that I have right here. Matter of fact, this is what's kind of cool about it. This SFP28, you know, can do up to 25 gigs, but it fits into this 10 gig card. See, this is the 25 gig card here. And this is the 10 gig card, but the, the I'm going to be doing some cable videos to kind of explain the connectors because uh, I think that's another confusing point um, is all the different connectors and what what goes where. Why would you use this or why would you do that and how you use 25 gig and when you would use what. So people in the data center already know, um, but they're that's going to be a fun. That's actually the next video I'll be doing. That's why all this is out. Uh, before I started, the table arrived and I started putting tables together and didn't do a second video today, so. Uh. Um. 50 gig over InfoBand. Cool. Well, I'm going to wind this down. Are there any final questions and Q&A I can answer for people here? Uh, I've been going for an hour and 10 minutes, so... The industry needs more connector standards. Well, that's actually what I what I want to point out. As I said, this I didn't just drop a card. Um, I only dropped the ten gig card. That's anyways. I didn't drop the twenty five gig one. Uh, the one thing about this is these cards. The standard is the nice thing is the backwards compatibility that SFP twenty eight offers. That's one of the things I'll be covering in the video. Is that there's a backwards compatibility. So they actually. They changed it, but the physical part is the same. And you can buy an SFP28 cable, but then use it as a uh, at a 10 gig rate. So there's cross compatibility that I think is actually kind of cool that does exist on these. So yes, because we certainly don't need another cabling standard. Channeled my inner Linus. We'll uh, hold an episode of Linus drop tips and uh, <laughs> how to drop things. I've not, I've not dropped many things. I break things occasionally. It's, but yeah. Uh, you can't get 10 gig out of PF sense because BSD there are the reason for TNSR is there are some limitations in single stream performance at 10 gig i if you look at my review i did of one of the pf senses i added in there single stream versus multi-stream performance that you can get 10 gig with multiple streams but you can't get it with a single stream these are actually some limitations not necessarily of pf sense but of the pf sense uh the way they built it on the bsd kernel and the way the pf filter works there's just there's some really nuanced to it, but there's, I, I don't know if it's the way it, it switches context in and out of the CPU to the RAM. There are some challenges in getting that speed beyond, uh, <clears throat> beyond and above those really high speeds in a single stream. If something is multiple streams, it can route at 10 gig and PF sense on a lot of the routers, but not in single stream. So when you're using iPerf, if you break it out to multiple streams, you'll saturate the connection. Oh, uh, let's see. <clears throat> um, Mr. Wigglesworth, thanks for the content. And I just came across your channel in 2021. I appreciate the information. Awesome. Thank you very much. Tabs or spaces? Ooh. Ah. Uh, I'm going to go tabs. Tabs look nicer. Yeah, so well, one of the reasons, this is one of the challenges. So the, the people at NetGate are acutely aware of BSD's limitations and how far you can push it. The one of the reasons they developed the TNSR is because PFSense is wildly popular in data centers. But as many of you have been pointing out over the last 10 minutes, hey, Tom, data centers have a lot faster than one gig and 10 gig connections. Yes, they do. This is where TNSR is designed to handle those faster connections. And if people think it's a replacement for PFSense. It is not. It is targeted very differently. But these are challenges they run into because 
you know, this is where Vios and some of those other things start coming in because you need very specific software to start routing at these high speeds because you got to think about how old and some of the re-engineering that needs to be done on kind of your standard firewall to be able to allow it to route at that speed. Speed is slowly, uh, I say slowly, I guess it's ramping up a little bit, but it's still ramping up um, at a rate faster than some of the companies are able to catch up with designing devices to be able to route it at an affordable, whatever you decide affordable is, at a more affordable price. As you uh, climb the scale up there, the price starts going up quite a bit for that type of routing equipment. Um, any experience with unpolar? No, I, I seen it. I know what it is. I didn't have a use case for it, but yeah. I didn't have really a use for it, so... Um... Your question doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. I see someone Samer saying, "Will PF sets stop Pegasus?" I don't know that you're you're trying to talk about phone spyware. I'm assuming and hoping PFS can look within the encrypted connection of it. I haven't. I don't know if there's a way at the firewall level that it can be identified reliably. I don't have an answer to that. So if there is a rule for it, as in a snort rule or a signature that can be loaded in, sure. I don't know that there's a specific Pegasus uh, rule for that. So yeah, not really easy in one answer. I know they can identify Pegasus through iPhone backups, but I don't know if they can identify it um, based on like a rules-based detection. Matter of fact, that's actually one of the challenges is, is people thinking the firewall, as data comes through it, you can just unravel all the data and, you know, that visibility gives you automatic, oh, we'll be able to see any type of, you know, malware and threats that come through. And that's just proving more and more challenging. Cryptography has become great. TLS uh, 1.3 you know, with perfect forward secrecy makes a really big challenge to unravel any of the packets in, 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 during transport before they get to the machine uh, to identify threats. And this is just the reality of it. Um, it's not your place where you want to put the, well, it's put what effort you can into it, but the end point is where you got to focus on the protections. Thank you very much, William. I will get my son a pizza for sure. Oh, uh, let's see. It's getting a C. I am not certified at anything, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about certifications. I lack any certifications. So I, I, they are sometimes necessary for jobs. Um, there may be requirements because I employ myself and I have now for like 18 years and I've never had to get certified. I always talk about doing it, but I never actually follow through. So, um, I don't know. I've, I don't have any certifications. Uh, and I don't think anyone has a full list of the IPs that Pegasus uses. So, <laughs> hey, get a coffee. Yes, I'll get my Big B coffee going in the morning. So thank you very much for the donation. Much appreciated. Yeah, if you're looking to get a job, um, you probably, especially depending on what job you're looking for, of course, uh, think about the career path you want to take and then go, hey, maybe I should get these certifications because the career path I want requires this, or at least a lot of job, a lot of employers seem to have that as a checkbox they want checked. So that's, you've got to start on what your career path is. Um, it doesn't hurt to get them. I mean, even if you just go through and do a practice test so you can make sure that you've you know, went through the knowledge and uh, make sure you fundamentally understand the knowledge and can pass the test. That's good. Even if you don't get the certification, it will make you feel better. Uh, it will. It, it'll be like, hey, cool. I know. I know this information. I, I went through. I read the book. I understood the course. Um, and then I put that answer back on a test. So I, I think they're good overall to do um, if, you know, especially if you're not sure what you want to do. 
don't necessarily spend too much on getting the cert, but go through the education and at least some practice exams because those are generally a pretty low cost, but it's a high time. You have to put a lot of time in that and decide if it's something you want to do. Ooh, thank you, William. More toppings on the pizza. That could be beer money. It's it's Thursday afternoon, so. Having certifications and experience should still be considered. Yeah. I mean, it's it's easier when you build a name for yourself to get a job, once you've got like a track record of you worked at this company. For example, if I wanted to uh, have a job, I have a long history of doing stuff in the tech world that someone would probably hire me to do all those things. So like, oh yeah, I've been doing this for years. I've been doing that for years, um, et cetera. That's really hard when you're starting out. So you they only really have these certifications that go on, but you gotta start somewhere. And sometimes that's just, you know, uh, sometimes that means you're going to job hop a little bit until you figure it out. I had, you know, I have a friend who did quite a bit of job hopping, um, but I said quite a bit. He, he bounced around for only four years before he landed a job that paid well over six figures in the tech world. And, you know, he's not that long in the tech world to land a really good paying job. Um, he did, but he did do some jobs where they really worked him hard for not a lot of money. Um, but he did, he took all that time and learned it. He absorbed all that knowledge and said, well, this place, the only path forward is to leave this place. Sometimes um, that is the path forward. And then you go, hey, look, you know, they value all that knowledge he had obtained working for the other place. Uh, I will do some new PFSense WireGuard videos. Definitely on my to-do list. 25 gig Mellanox for back end for connecting to storage servers. Yep. Nice. Fast stuff. Yes. 100,000 plus a year. Oh, tequila. I'm more of a whiskey guy, but I'll drink tequila. So thank you very much again, William. Much appreciated. <laughs> I guess I'll stay on here if you keep throwing money at me. I mean, I, uh, I have a price. <laughs> I have a price. I'll hang out for money. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, it, certifications are helpful. They're certainly not definitive uh, that you know something. I mean, that's it's hard. It's really hard as a recruiter to hire people and understand that they know what they know. Um, and it's kind of scary because you kind of have to turn them loose in your environment, at least not without supervision, but you kind of have to see how they would solve things, ask them how they solve problems. And I, I understand that some of these interviews get really complex because they actually give you a problem to solve. Um, one of my friends, when he went in for an interview for a programming job, they were like, you don't get to Google this or anything else. Your interview is literally, here's the problem, sit here and code for it. When you're done, walk over to the next place and we'll talk to you about an actual job here. Some people could not complete the task. He was actually there with other people, which also made him nervous because yes, am I competing with them? They said, we have 12 spots and we found six of you that could even make it this far. <laughs> and uh, he works for a very higher, much higher in programming place. So, the, you know, uh, be prepared because some of them may question you like that. Um... You're having trouble finding a Linux engineering role in Lansing. I would not look in a specific area. Look remotely. Lots of places are hiring for remote people. All the people I know that are Linux engineers, they do not work on site. So I don't know where on site offers jobs in any specific area, but all my Linux friends that work at with different places are 100% remote work. And they have been for years. This isn't a recent event. Like they've been working remotely for years. Um, so. I'd look remotely. <laughs> my, my, when my one friend works for uh, a UK company, even though he's here, he actually lives in Michigan, but he works for a UK company doing Linux stuff. I mean, because they had a really good offer. Uh, I, I don't know any, if you're just looking in uh, narrow geography, you're, you're going to have a much harder time. Um... I don't know. I think there's certifications on structured wiring that you can probably do. I don't have those, but uh, 
follow people on, I don't know. I don't have a good suggestion for structure cabling. I'll think about that one later. Uh, low voltage nation. Yeah, that's probably a good one. That's what I was trying to think of uh, was where to go. Like if you look up low voltage nation, there's a lot of people in there that'll talk a lot about best practice. So. Um, Xavier is indisposed doing some projects. So, uh, how they got hacked is, uh, on permanent hiatus until we decide what we're going to do. So that's, a, that's way on hold right now. We want to do something different with it. I, that's just a down the road thing. So I seen Mo a few weeks back said, hi, BS one for a few minutes. That's about it. He's doing well. Uh, he's got a good job. How's the battery life on my ThinkPad? Um, I don't really push it to its limits very often, so I don't think about it. But like this X250, uh, the battery is still good on it all these years later. All Any of the ThinkPads I've had have always had, I thought, a reasonable battery life. But... I'm just scrolling Reddit if I'm not doing something like this. So I'm not really taxing it. So it's not doing much uh, to really push the battery. Like the CPU is idle almost all the time on it. Uh, no, I am not going to review the Unify UDM Pro uh, SE. Has nothing to do with NDA on that. Um, Unify, I, I just kind of... Like, they don't send me hardware anymore, which I'm fine with, because um, I just buy what I want from them. But I, I don't like any... Their Dream Machine, all they did was, it looks like they added a few extra features. I'm not huge on their lack of attention to, uh, to their routing equipment on making it better. So I doubt we're going to buy it. The... The two and a half gig WAN link is the least of anyone's worries on a unified dream machine because yeah, it's the fact that it does such a poor job at routing functions or advanced routing functions is mostly where it falls flat on its face. So people, you know, so many people contact us, they go, I need this advanced function with my unified dream machine. We're like, I'm sorry. And they're like, well, I got the pro version. That's how they reply. I'm like, I'm sorry, -er. uh, it doesn't do those things. It does. They're like, hey, I need this, this, this stuff. I'm like, yeah, that sucks. It doesn't do that. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. And people want us like, we won't do custom config files for USG pros for the same reason. It's just not great. Yeah, it's like, it's a UDM pro SE, um, I didn't. I did not read the full specs, but I've seen people mention what uh, Gear, Gareth just mentioned. Of hey, it comes with some PoE ports. So uh, cool. If you are happy with basic routing functions, plus you need PoE ports, maybe it's something that'll make you happy. I run into more and more people that want um, uh, advanced routing functions, and that's where it doesn't make people happy. So that that's mostly where the problem is with it. All right, seeing as the flow of money stop, you're not throwing them dollars and making it rain on me. So, <laughs> no, actually, I got to get going anyways. Uh, I do have some stuff I have to go to. So <laughs> I will um, get back to figuring out what I got to do for my desk and my setup. And I got to get all that thought about and put together. Uh, I got to get this video done. But I want to build my desk, and I got to take apart my office. So, yeah. Tesla videos. I should do a Tesla video. It feels very off-topic for my channel, because my channel's become more focused on tech. But I did record some video of me in the Smoky Mountains, and I thought about talking about how I... We actually charged the battery going down the mountain. Uh, we gained, like, 7% battery from the top of the mountain to the bottom. So, there's that. So, yeah. <laughs> Suburban computers for life. Someone knows my history. Suburban computers, man. Wow. That's that brings back memories. I, can't, I think I've talked about it on the channel. That was among the names I had in 2004. Been out on a bike, been doing that. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm easy to get sidetracked. Really easy to get sidetracked. 
everything's clickable and everything's shiny. <laughs> that's just part of it. That's why, uh, that's actually why I disconnect from things because there's not a bunch of, when, when there's not like 200 people on a live stream or I'm not connected to the internet with a bunch of social media things I'm doing, um, I can focus on projects. I just turn everything off. <laughs> oh yes, Ronnie is still crazy. Absolutely, positively, I, I have no doubt that Ronnie's not crazy. Um, yes, so I, I'll i leave you with that because I, I know SC is commenting. I don't know who SC is, but clearly they know. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who bashed the like button. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you again for everyone who threw money at me. Uh, it is much appreciated. And uh, see you guys next time. And hopefully tomorrow I'll have a video talking about some 25 gig stuff. So, yes, I'm in a network loop. I mean, I got, I got the loop.